What I'd like to do now is discuss a second yield criteria. Again, this yield criteria is used for polycrystalline metals mostly, and it's known as the Henke von Mies condition. And it's an energy-based criteria for yield. So the, tr the trust cr criteria is really based on an, a generalization of the notion of resolved shear stress. The Henke von Mies condition is based on an energetic idea. And it's based also on this observation that yield in metals is independent of, of pressure in the system. And the main idea is to use strain energy to determine yield, and in particular, to figure out at what level of strain energy in the system does the material yield, and then use that as a criteria to uh, determine yield. So you measure strain energy at yield with a basic experiment, such as a tension experiment, and then use that as a calibration constant to determine when you have yield in the system. So. Let's remind ourselves first of the expression for the strain energy density for an elastic material. Uh, so linear elastic, so it's one half times all the pairs of the stresses with their conjugate strains. So we have the sigma xx, epsilon xx, sigma yy, epsilon yy, sigma zz, epsilon zz, etc. And we have the shear uh, pairs here, sigma xy, gamma xy, etc. So this gives us the strain energy in a loaded elastic body. And now the thing to remember is this idea that yield in metals is independent of pressure. So what I'd like to do is rewrite this expression here to separate out the pressure contribution from the deviatoric contribution. So and remember that we have this relationship that says that the stress is equal to the deviator plus the pressure in the system. And so I can use that to kind of separate things out. I can substitute for every one of these sigmas in terms of the, the deviatoric stress components and the pressure component. And likewise, I can determine expressions for the strains in terms of the stresses using Hooke's law. So if I go ahead and go through that exercise, and it's a bit of algebra, but it's certainly doable, I can write down the strain energy in terms of two parts, one that only depends on the components of the deviatoric stresses, and one that only depends on com on the pressure of the system. And then, of course, I had the elastic constants, the Poisson ratio, and the Young's modulus in this expression. So this last term in this expression for W is the pressure energy, because you'll notice it has the pressure here. And then we have some elastic constants sitting out front. The first term here is the deviatoric strain energy. It only depends on the components of the deviatoric stress tensor. So we have the sigma xx, or sorry, the sxx, syy, etc., including the shear pieces here. And then we have some material constants, 1 plus the Poisson ratio over E sitting out front. And the basic idea of the Henke von Mies criteria is that we're going to say that the deviatoric strain energy has to be less than or equal to some calibration constant. So that's a and that calibration constant is the deviatoric strain energy in a one-dimensional uniaxial tension test at yield. So that's this is the basic idea of the Henke von Mies condition. Now normally we don't write it this way, we actually rewrite it a little bit. So let's first figure out what the calibration constant is. So at at yield in one dimensions, the stress state is going to be sigma y, let's say in the x direction, and zero in all the other directions, including the shear stresses. Now, for this state of stress, the pressure is going to be equal to one-third sigma y. So I add up the diagonal elements, sigma y plus zero, plus zero, and divide by three to get the pressure. So the general relationship for the pressure, again, is one-half, or sorry, one-third, sigma xx plus sigma yy plus sigma zz. And that gives us the pressure. So if I subtract that off from the stress, then I have the deviatoric stress. So two-thirds sigma y in the x direction, minus one-third sigma y in the y direction, and minus one-third sigma y in the z direction. And now from this state of stress, I can go ahead and evaluate the deviatoric strain energy here for the calibration constant. If I go ahead and do that, I end up with one-half, one plus nu over e, two-thirds sigma y squared. So that's my calibration constant. And now I can put that together with the general expression for the deviatoric strain energy. And you'll notice then the elastic constants actually drop out of the criteria. So I end up with this sum of squares of the, uh, the components of the deviatoric stress tensor less than or equal to 2 thirds sigma y squared. So this is a slightly easier version to apply of, of the, the Henke von Mies criteria, easier than, say, this full energetic expression. Now, 
usually we have the stress tensor given to us in terms of the regular stress components, not the deviatoric stress components. So one thing that we can do is we can go in and we can substitute back in for the deviatoric stress components using this relationship here and rewrite it in terms of the actual stress components. And if I go ahead and do that, I end up with this expression here. So I have one half times the difference of the normal stresses squared plus three times the square of the shear stresses. It has to be less than or equal to sigma y squared. So this is the, the most convenient form of the Henke von Mies condition to use. Uh, there is one other bit of terminology that's useful to note is that if I take the square root of the left hand side here, then that's off something that's often known as the von Mies equivalent stress. So people will sometimes write that as sigma bar. So sigma bar then is equal to one half times all these differences squared plus three times all the shears squared square root. And so that's known as the von Mies equivalent stress. So you sometimes uh, see that uh, written down or represented in graphs. And, and the reason people do that is because it's a nice single scalar that you can use to represent a full state of stress and then compare it then against sigma y. And that you're comparing against sigma y, the yield, because there's this square root sitting up here. Now, there are a couple of important remarks here uh, about the von Mies or the Henke von Mies condition. Number one is that there's no need to draw more circles. So all you have to do is evaluate. You take the state of stress, whatever it happens to be, sigma xx, sigma yy, etc., and you just evaluate it. And so that's a lot easier than doing the more circle, finding eigenvalues and, and things of that nature. Uh, it is pressure independent by construction because we're working with the deviatoric strain energy on the criteria. So deviatoric strain energy is e less than or equal to deviatoric strain energy in a 1D calibration test. Uh, now, one thing to note about this is that it's going to give slightly different predictions from the Truscott condition, but they're not too much different. So the, and both conditions are really models of, of real physical behavior, so there's nothing to be alarmed about with respect to the fact that the criteria give you different, uh, slightly different predictions for yield, but the, the predictions are actually quite close to each other, so it doesn't matter too much which can, criteria you use. Uh, I think probably most people prefer the Henke von Mies criteria. It tends to be easier to use for most people, but uh, in some situations the Tresca criteria is uh, easier to use. Also, some people prefer the Tresca criteria because of its connection to the Schmidt resolve shear stress notion. But either condition is perfectly acceptable in uh, standard engineering computations.